This is going to be a fight. The president says we don't wait uh, for the blame game or for the insurance companies to weigh in here. Pay for it now. Go back and do the rest later. Is that going to fly in the House? We'll see. The House Freedom Caucus is really putting the line there. Um, and already Speaker Johnson is having to fight them on other fronts, including yeah. Ukraine aid. So and they're also trying to to rope into this uh, the liquefied national gas ban that the administration um, uh, put into place. And they want to overturn that as a, uh, you know, in, in exchange for freeing money for Baltimore. So yeah, sure. it's all very complicated. Most likely this funding for Baltimore will go through. It's supposed to be somewhere north of about a billion dollars and won't be needed all at one time, which is why you don't see this traditional request saying we need X amount of money. They're still assessing the situation, but they do need money to at least begin or to pay for the beginnings of the recovery and then the rebuilding. So we'll see what happens in the next week or so. Yeah, yeah pretty remarkable to make a blank check request right. when you have also asked for explicit dollar figures in requests in terms of funding for some of what you've mentioned, allies including Ukraine. When they return, given everything we've heard from Speaker Mike Johnson over the last week, indicating we could see this on the floor, maybe in the form of a loan or using foreign Russian assets that have been seized to pay for Ukraine's war effort, how hard is it going to be to actually happen after all that talk when he's back in the chamber and has to look Marjorie Taylor Greene in the eye? <laughs> I think we're all going to be looking directly at that interchange when the House <laughs> returns next week. It is going to be very interesting to see how this plays out. But the speaker continues to stand by his comments that he plans to bring Ukraine to the floor. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't expect that vote to happen next week. We're told it could be several weeks before yeah. they actually get a vote, something to vote on on the floor. In the meantime, they're trying to haggle over what they can put into it to sweeten the pot for Republicans who yes, would vote right. against it, mm -hmm. and also for for Johnson to save his own hide in, in <laughs> terms as Marjorie Taylor Greene goes after yeah. his job. If this is tied with Israeli funding, there's a question about whether outrage from progressive Democrats over Joe Biden's policies and. Israel's actions in Gaza might end up sinking Ukraine funding. How much of a concern is that for this White House? It is an extremely tricky political calculation. For the first time this week, we saw some of President Biden's staunchest allies on the Hill, including Senator Coons from his home state, come out in support of putting uh, restrictions on this aid to Israel if if they go into Rafa, if they do not take proper safeguards yeah. against uh, uh, killing civilians. Mm -hmm. So it is a, an incredibly difficult political needle. It's something that is dividing the Democratic Party, and, uh, and Biden is going to need full Democratic support to get this through. You have all of these different factors coming down to this one vote on this aid package, and mm -hmm. it's going to be a fragile coalition that finally pushes it over the finish line. Yeah. That's and of course, sure. that's not even to mention they need to reauthorize FISA within the next Which several could come weeks. Which first. And yeah, yeah the, the order of operations yeah. here is very much very in question. True. Megan, buckle up. It's going to be a Thank fun you. couple of weeks for you and the rest of the Congress team. Megan Scully, of course, leads our congressional coverage here at Bloomberg. Elsewhere, we got a blowout jobs report this morning. Payrolls rising in March by the most in nearly a year, topping even the highest analyst estimates at over 300,000. We got reaction from economists, investors, and policymakers today on Bloomberg. This was a hot report. The jobs report that confirmed U.S. economic exceptionalism. Another incredible uh, jobs report, right? 303,000 jobs. 300,000 jobs that were created in the United States this month. It's on top of historic gains in the labor market. I think the Fed would still like to get two to three cuts in this year. I, you know, you need to see the data improve. Joining us now for more is Bloomberg's Enda Curran. So, Enda, of course, more people getting jobs is a good thing. But there are some cases in which good things could also be bad things if it means that this is an economy and a labor market still running so hot that the fight against inflation cannot yet be run. One, how should we be thinking about this in terms of the implications for what the Federal Reserve is likely to do? Well, the good news for us, broad-based gains, health care, construction, government, leisure and hospitality adding enough jobs. That it's back to its pre-pandemic levels now. Uh, more people also joining the workforce, so the participation rate going up. And by the way, there were upward revisions to data sets from the previous few months. So mm -hmm. these are very good employment numbers for any economy. That's the good story. But then to your point, 
The double-edged sword is that obviously it suggests uh, there's plenty of work out there that will keep some pressure on wages. And for keeping pressure on wages, well, then that doesn't exactly lean itself towards the Fed bringing down interest rates in a hurry. So I think the, the, the negative takeaway from today, if you're in that camp, is there's no case for a near-term rate cut. And you see traders already adjusting their bets on that. We're not hearing uh, from Democrats like Elizabeth Warren quite as loudly about the Fed damaging the job market with higher for longer and the... Uh, is there still a risk that this, uh, that this series of rate increases could actually end up damaging what's an historically strong job market? All of the danger because, you know, the jobs market is a lagging indicator. Yeah. So at some, at some point this could catch up on us. That's the concern. Um, part of the story is immigration. That's really been up, uh, boosting the jobs force. Mm -hmm. There was a warning signal in today's data, actually, about, to your point, Joe, and that comes to black unemployment. Mm -hmm. That increased to 6.4% from 56 Within that, the biggest hit was to black women. But the point is, some analysts make the point that Black people are the last to be hired in an upswing and the first to be fired in a downturn. Uh, so some are warning this could be an early warning signal. We're not there yet. It's only one so, data print. Yeah. It'll take a few more months to figure this out. But that just goes to your point is, as one warning signal. Well, I'm glad you brought that up, Enda, because we actually asked the Deputy Treasury Secretary, Wally Adeyemo, about that black unemployment rate earlier today. This is what he told our Anne-Marie Horder. So it's important to remember that where we started. And when we came into office at the beginning of the Biden administration, black unemployment was above 16 percent. It's come down to historic lows. And I was in the Obama administration, and it took us years to see unemployment come down during the great financial crisis. And we've seen far faster movement there. So an interesting point there uh, from the deputy secretary. We also had joining us at Bloomberg earlier today the secretary, the acting secretary of labor, Julie Sue, and was asked specifically about the role that immigration may factor in here, knowing we are all having an active debate about immigration, more specifically perhaps illegal migration over the southern border. But that could be what we're seeing in terms of the labor force participation and just helping catalyze the job growth we have seen. Yeah, it has become a huge talking point in recent months ever since the CBO put out a report putting numbers on the contribution from immigration to population growth. The thinking is that the um, we're talking here about at least documented migrants are taking pressure off the inflation side of things and they are filling roles that would go unfilled. Now, of course, there's a separate political debate about what's going on at the southern border. But right now, economists are saying this immigration story has probably Probably been uh, un under considered mm. when it comes to the U.S. economic debate, and a lot of people are now focusing on just what contribution all of these new arrivals are making to the workforce. 